Please turn with me to the book of Proverbs, the eighth chapter. Be reading verses 22 through 31. Hear now the word of the living God. The Lord possessed me at the beginning of his way, before his works of old. From everlasting I was established, from the beginning, from the earliest times of the earth. When there were no depths, I was brought forth. When there were no springs abounding with water, before the mountains were settled, before the hills, I was brought forth. While he had not yet made the earth and the fields, nor the first dust of the world. When he established the heavens, I was there. When he inscribed a circle on the face of the deep, when he made firm the skies above, when the springs of the deep became fixed, when he set for the sea its boundary so that the water would not transgress his command, when he marked out the foundations of the earth, then I was beside him as a master workman, and I was daily his delight, rejoicing always before him, rejoicing in the world, his earth, and having my delight in the sons of men. Now we turn in the New Testament to John chapter 17. Looking this morning at verses 4 and 5. I glorified you on the earth, having accomplished the work which you have given me to do. Now, Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. Let's pray and ask God's blessing. Lord, thank you for giving us this word of truth. And now as we consider our Savior's prayer, give us insight and understanding, keep us from all distraction, for we pray it in Jesus' name, amen. How would you respond if I told you that our text today has nothing whatsoever to do with you? Would you be surprised, or would you be offended, perhaps uninterested in knowing any more? In the middle of the last century, the great Welsh preacher, Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, believed that the Christian world was falling into an all-consuming subjectivism and selfishness. For a variety of reasons, Believers were mainly and mostly thinking about themselves and their own experiences rather than considering the objective truth about God and his glory. What does this passage have for me became the primary question of that day. Any thoughts of the infinite, eternal, and unchangeable God were relegated to secondary or tertiary status. Now, if that was true already 60, 70 years ago, how much more is it the case in our day? Interest in theology wanes, while Christian experience becomes the be-all, end-all. Me, me, me. What does this have to do for me? If you think I'm exaggerating, I would invite you to go to the local Christian bookstore and find out how many books on their shelves are theology and how many of them are personal experience oriented. The vast majority of Christian books published today are basically Christian self-help books. Theology books, though they're popular among Reformed folks, don't really get much traction in the broader Christian culture. 
In a certain sense, I would say to you this morning that John 17 verses 4 and 5 isn't really about you at all. It doesn't mention you. In fact, it doesn't even refer to you. And yet I think that you would be well served to take a deep and serious interest in what Jesus says here in these phrases of his prayer. For if you will allow yourself to be fascinated with what you find in these verses, it can actually help you immensely. As Lloyd-Jones put it, the real cure for most of our subjective ills is ultimately to be so enraptured by the beauty and glory of Christ that we will forget ourselves and not have time to think about ourselves at all. Dear friends, this is what our passage can do for you today. It can help you to forget about yourself as you become so enraptured by the beauty and the glory of Christ. So as we walk about the text today, I first want to consider the native glory of Christ. Then we want to look at Jesus' glorious work and finish with Jesus' modest request. When Jesus prays in verse 5 of our passage that the Father would glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was, he reveals some important information about his native glory. Now when I say native glory, this is the glory that he had before the world existed. He reveals here some very important information about it. It is the glory of the pre-incarnate Christ, enjoyed throughout eternity past. Now we don't have much specific information about that native glory, but we do know certain things. We know that it was a glory which the Savior possessed with you, meaning with the Father. So this was the shared glory of the Holy Trinity, a glory that they together possessed in that fellowship of love for the ages and eons before the world was created. The author of Hebrews references this when he says about Jesus and he is the radiance of his glory and the exact representation of his nature and upholds all things by the word of his power. Jesus is the radiance, the outshining of God's glory. He is the exact representation of the Father's nature and he upholds all things by the word of his power. And so as Jesus comes and lives on earth, he is shining forth. He is radiating that magnificent beauty of the glory of the Father. We can see something of that native glory from three related passages in Scripture. The first is the Shekinah glory cloud that went before the people of Israel during their wanderings in the wilderness. If you recall, that was a pillar of fire by night and a pillar of cloud by day. And that brightness, that shining radiance, was a manifestation of the glory of God. The second passage of Scripture is the Mount of Transfiguration. There, in the presence of Peter, James, and John, the veil was dropped for a brief glimpse at the glory of Christ. 
His garment shone with a radiance brighter than that of the sun. And for that brief little moment, that snippet of time, we see the glory of Christ radiating and shining upon his followers. The other significant passage that comes to mind is from the first chapter of Revelation, where Jesus appears to John, and his appearance there is stunning and brilliant. In fact, it was so radiant, so amazing, that John fell down as though dead. And these three passages give us snapshots of the eternal glory that had always existed within the Trinity in eternity past. It was a fellowship of perfect love, complete cooperation, and fullness of glory shared equally by God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Well, not only did the blessed Trinity enjoy complete glory from eternity past, but that glory was on display in the work of creation week. Specifically, Jesus' glory is seen in how he made the world and all things in the beginning. Proverbs 8, which we just read, speaks of this as Christ, the master builder, was at the Father's side. The Son was daily the delight of the Father, even as the Son made the world and everything in it. And very interestingly, the Son took great joy in the children of men. He delighted in the sons of men, which further manifests his glory and his honor. So all throughout the creation process, we see Christ functioning in beauty and glory. Just as an aside, this is one of many reasons why we must reject the theory of evolution. Because it robs Christ of his glory and says it wasn't Jesus who was making the world and everything in it. No, it was these mindless, impersonal forces that were developing somehow mysteriously on their own with no guidance of any creative being. And that's to snatch away the glory of Christ and say, we're not going to ascribe glory to Christ. We're going to blame it on fate or chance or something like that. So creation displays Christ's glory. The same could really be said about his work throughout the ages of the Old Testament. Whenever and wherever he appears, he is glorious in his word and his works. And you might wonder, where does Christ appear in the Old Testament? I think most commentators are consistent in saying whenever we have an appearance of God in the flesh, that that's the pre-incarnate Christ. So for instance, when the visitors came to Abram before the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, when they ate with Abraham and Sarah, and then when they talked with Abraham, that was Christ. And it was Christ who went to Sodom and was there with the angels investigating the wickedness of that place. Or when Joshua comes to the commander of the Lord's armies, and he asks that mighty man, whose side are you on? And the mighty man says, wrong question. It's not whose side am I on, but are you on my side? It's again Christ. And so all of these manifestations of Christ that we find sprinkled throughout the Old Testament, we see again the glory of Jesus in his work and his words. And so he's got that pre-existent 
eternity past glory. He's got the glory of creation week. He's got the glory of his work in the Old Testament times. And all of that glory he laid aside when he came down to earth to take on our humanity. He was the favorite of heaven. And he laid aside that glory and that honor, those prerogatives. He didn't lay aside his deity. He didn't stop being eternally and fully God, but he laid aside his glory. While he was on earth, Jesus was veiled with flesh. Taking the form of a bondservant, he did not appear especially glorious to the sons of men. And part of the reason for that was his purpose in taking on his earthly ministry. For throughout those three and a half years, Jesus was not seeking his own glory, but rather to bring glory to God the Father on the earth. He came to make the Father known, and that meant bringing honor and praise to his Father. In verse 4, Jesus references this in his prayer. I glorified you, having accomplished the work which you have given me to do. When the Son left his heavenly home, he had an assignment from the Father. The Father gave him specific work to accomplish. And here, as elsewhere in the Gospels, we find that Jesus was not only conscious of his obligations, but that he fulfilled them purposefully. This assignment from the Father would include all that had transpired up until that night, but also go beyond it as well. It would include the events that were almost upon them, his arrest, the trial, the beating, the humiliation, the crucifixion, the suffering, the death, the burial, the resurrection, and the ascension. All of it would be done. Jesus would fulfill every letter of his assigned task as well as the true spirit of his duty. And as Jesus embraced and fulfilled this great assignment, he bore testimony to the great glory of God the Father. Now as we think about his earthly ministry in this light, we can isolate certain aspects of his ministry and see how they specifically brought glory to God. Think, for instance, about his teaching. As Jesus spoke to his disciples, and even as he taught the multitudes, he was always showing respect and deference to the Father. He taught them about the Father with a due and proper reverence to God the Father. He frequently reminded his hearers that he wasn't making these things up, but that they were the words of the Father. So in his teaching ministry, we can see that Jesus was no maverick. He was no rogue promoting his own ideas, pursuing his own agenda, but rather he was very faithfully and diligently passing on to his audience what he had heard and learned from the Father himself. So all of his teaching serves to bring glory and honor to God the Father. Or look at Jesus' ministry of miracles, his healing the sick, his raising the dead, his feeding enormous crowds of hungry people. In all of his miracles, Jesus was very conscious and very deliberate to direct his attention and their attention also 
to the Father above. Repeatedly, we see Jesus lifting his eyes to heaven and praying out loud. And at one point he says, I'm not praying this for you, as if you need to hear my voice, Father. I'm praying it for these people to hear. So he's very carefully helping them to realize that it is the Father who has the power to do these great things. And it reminds them that these miracles did not happen by some independent or autonomous power that he personally held, but it was the Father working in and through him always. And then even in his hour of suffering, even during his passion, what does he do in the Garden of Gethsemane? He prays, saying to his Father, not my will, but thine be done. What does he tell Pilate later that evening? That if it were not for the Father, Pilate would possess no authority to do what Pilate did. Even on the cross, his eyes are upon his Father, as he cries out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? So in every aspect of his life and ministry, even in his suffering and death, he is bringing attention, honor, glory to God the Father. And this work of Christ was not without effect. Let me give you just one example of the many examples available throughout the Gospels. This one comes from Luke chapter 5. It takes place when Jesus had just healed the man who was lowered through the roof by his four friends. And you might remember that story, how this man comes down on the pallet being suspended by these ropes and he's dropped right into Jesus' presence, and Jesus heals him. And listen to the response that he received. Immediately, he got up before them and picked up what he had been lying on and went home glorifying God. They were all struck with astonishment and began glorifying God. God. And they were filled with fear, saying, we have seen remarkable things today. So not only was the healed man glorifying God, but all of the people present that day, all the witnesses of this miracle, began glorifying God. And that is what Jesus did throughout his earthly ministry. He was constantly aiming to bring attention to God the Father. And he had success. And people's eyes were lifted to the great God of heaven. And they did bring glory to his name. Well, in view of his former glory, his previous glory... And in light of his work in glorifying the Father during his earthly ministry, Jesus makes a request. And I believe this to be a most modest request. He asks in verse 5 that the Father glorify me together with yourself with the glory which I had with you before the world was. So he is asking there that the Father would glorify the Son. Now to properly understand his request, I want you to listen first of all to some comments from William Hendrickson. He says, it is hardly necessary to add that in this yearning for future glory or for future joy, there was not even a trace of vulgar selfishness. To be sure, 
Whatever God does, he does for his own glory. And Jesus is God. It's important to know Jesus is not being selfish by asking the Father to glorify him. He is not a spoiled child who is clamoring for the attention of a distracted parent. But rather, this is God the Son asking the Father to bring him what is due to the Son, namely, glory. I'm reminded of one of the comments that Dr. Carson made during our Reformation conference, how this particular point really trips up a lot of young people in our world today. They want to know why is it that this God is demanding glory? Isn't that just vulgar selfishness? And the answer is no. It's not just someone saying, oh, look at me, look at me, look at me. He is the God of glory. And to ascribe glory to him is simply to recognize what is rightfully and properly his. Now, if Jesus were nothing but a mere man, even a good man, then this request would be vulgar selfishness. But he's not a mere man. He's not just a human being. He's not even a good human being. He's not even the best human being. He is the God-man. And he is glorious. And he is simply asking for what is rightfully his, the glory that is due to his name. Now, the reason I think that this is modest is because of the specific specifics of Jesus' request here. He is asking for this mutual glory, this glory together with yourself. And he is asking merely and simply for the restoration of what he had previously held in eternity past. If you notice his request, he's not asking for anything new or different or better, but simply for what he had previously laid aside before his incarnation. May I take up my former glory again. That's the gist of the request. And if I might illustrate with something that might perk you up if you need perking up. I wore my overcoat this morning. It's pretty cold out there. I don't like being cold. When I got in the building, I put it on a hanger in the hall. When I get ready to leave this place, I am not going to ask for a new coat, a better coat, a fancy coat, or a warmer coat. I just want my overcoat back. Jesus had laid aside his glory, like a man would lay aside an overcoat, and he just says, can I have my glory back? That's all I want. That's all I'm asking for. The glory that I had from eternity past, can I have that again? You see, this is a very modest request. What the Father actually delivers is far more and far better than just Jesus' former glory. The Father will bestow on him an even greater glory, which is due to the Son in light of his accomplished work of redemption. We can see this from several passages of Scripture. Hebrews 2.9 but we do see him who was made for a little while lower than the angels, namely Jesus, because of the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. So Jesus was made a little lower than the angels for a short time, 
But because of the suffering of his death, he is now crowned with glory and honor. Acts chapter 5, verse 31. He is the one whom God has exalted to his right hand as a prince and a savior to grant repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. God exalted Jesus to his right hand as a prince and a savior. But the clearest passage and the strongest passage is Philippians 2, verses 9 through 11. After going through his humiliation, his suffering, even to the point of death, it says, for this reason also, God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So because he was obedient unto death, God didn't just restore his former glory, but God highly exalted him. In fact, he is so high now that he has the name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee bows in heaven and on earth, and every tongue will confess Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now, I think this only makes sense. The Father had given Jesus the great assignment of coming to earth and purchasing men for God at the price of his own blood shed upon the cross. The Father had sent him through entire humiliation, humiliation even to the point of death and burial. So would not the Father be thankful and show appreciation for a job well done? Would not the Father highly exalt Christ with a glory that far exceeded the glory which he had previously enjoyed? So while the Son asks for little, the Father grants great and exceeding honors to his glorious Son. So while he had been glorious from eternity past and in creation and in the Old Testament and during his earthly ministry, now having died and risen and ascended, he is crowned with ultimate glory. And his glory now far excels what he had previously enjoyed because the Father has rewarded him for his successful work of redemption. If the Father had just said, well, you've gone and done this great thing, you've suffered and died, and you've done what I've asked you, here's your old glory back. That would be so unlike God. God does not see work well done and say, ah, eh, well, that's just what I expected and you're going to get no further reward. When that person comes, when that servant comes to him and says, Lord, you gave me five talents and I have brought five more. Here are your talents. God does not just shrug and say, well, okay, thanks. He says, no, come into your master's happiness and give that good servant more. And Jesus was the best servant ever. And for God to reward him with exceeding glory is just for God to be God and to do what he does when he sees work assigned, finished in fullness. So do you now see him in all of his beauty and glory? Do you see the glorious Christ who is pictured in these verses? Do you see him in his 
eternal glory, his creation glory, his redemption glory, his eternal future glory. Do you look upon him and see him as altogether lovely and beautiful and magnificent? And has this vision of his glory caused you, even for this brief time, to forget about yourself, about all of your aches and your pains, your complaints and your sorrows, your disappointments, your despair? I experienced this last week, last Lord's Day. As I mentioned on Sunday night, we had started a project replacing a part of my Honda, and we got to a certain point on Saturday with George at Carl's, and we were just stuck. And that just kind of left me hanging in this limbo of despair. And even Sunday morning, I woke up just feeling, oh, man, is this car work ever going to end? And then as I did my preparations, and as I came to God's house, and as I preached to you about the incarnate Christ and his glory and beauty, the vision of Christ dispelled my concern about my car. And then Tuesday, we went back to the shop and we finished it up and Thursday it drove away with great rejoicing. (laughs) But you see, when you start to focus on Christ, it drives out all the worries that vex you. It drives out all of the anxieties that trouble you. It shrinks things down to their proper proportions And it reminds you that car repairs are part of life and they will be done and gone soon enough. Don't worry about it. Why do people get so wrapped up? Why do people end up kind of groping around in life in in various levels of depression? One of the reasons is that they see cease to look upon Christ and his glory. And when Christ and his glory are absent from their sight, everything fills the vacuum. Troubles and cares of life grow bigger and bigger and bigger because there's no Christ in their view to dispel and to keep things in their proper proportions. So look upon Jesus, see him in his glory, and come back to your senses and stop worrying about things that you shouldn't be worrying about anyway. And just rejoice this day that you are connected to this infinitely glorious Savior who is a prince and a Savior and a king of glory. Who is this king of glory? The Lord Jesus Christ. He is the king of glory, and he is my glorious king and savior, and I will just rest in him today, and he will chase away all the cares and troubles of my life. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, you are so infinitely, inexpressibly glorious. And Lord, as we have looked upon you just briefly today, fill our eyes and our minds with that surpassing glory that is yours, that we might have hope and might not be troubled with the anxious cares of life here on earth. Keep your beauty in our hearts and minds throughout this Sabbath day. For we ask in Jesus' name, amen.